So the performance methods we'll be going through uh, are decline analysis and material balance. A lot of the discussion is going to be decline analysis. There will be a bit of discussion on material balance. And simulation, there will be a little bit of discussion on simulation, but uh, not a whole lot. Um, decline analysis and material balance, once again, you're seeing a reference to a very famous paper written by a gentleman named Harps. Uh, that basically was the fundamentals for decline analysis principles in oil and gas evaluation. So what are performance methods? Uh, the definition is using observable trends in reservoir production and pressure to estimate remaining reserves. So the assumption uh, that underlies all of the performance methods is that extrapolating observed trends will allow predictions of future performance. So the advantages to performance methods, um, greatest accuracy, generally you have the most data when you're applying these methods, so that helps, but uh, they tend to be the most accurate because they have the least number of unknown variables. They're widely accepted, uh, and decline analysis especially is, is quick and visible. It's, um, it's very easy to check whether a decline looks reasonable or not. Disadvantages, uh, the amount of information required, you have to be at a certain level of maturity in your production or your development to apply performance methods. Uh, decline analysis, we'll talk about when it's valid and when it's maybe not as valid and, and certain things you have to watch for when you're trying to apply decline analysis. So there are, there are situations where people will apply decline analysis when they really shouldn't. You can get conflicting results from conflicting data. And as with pretty much everything in oil and gas evaluation, there's no one unique solution. We'll talk about decline analysis first. This is uh, when we say 90, 95% of evaluation is deterministic. Um, the vast majority of evaluations, as long as you have assets on production um, that have a declinable trend, you're always going to apply decline analysis. You may use some of the other methods to verify your estimates, such as back checking recovery factors. But this is essentially the top priority for evaluations. If you can use decline analysis, you will use decline analysis. So it goes all the way back to the early 20th century. Um, originally, it was simply based on observation. Uh, it's used to estimate recoverable volumes, and there's some papers, um, as I said, from the early 1900s and the mid 1900s. Uh, and more recently, Fetkovich. Um, Another big name in oil and gas in North America, he, uh, he has a lot of, there's a set of type curves called the Fetkevich type curves that tell you what stage of production or what type of production um, your well or production data is in. So the logic behind decline analysis, again, you're using observed trends, so you're, you're using the historical production trends, production or pressure trends, uh, or both to forecast. You must be able to recognize the trends. You have to have a basic general understanding of, of what you're looking for and uh, for that specific type of asset, what a normal decline would be anticipated to look like. It assumes that past performance is a good indication of, of future performance. There's two aspects to the analysis. Um, performance indicators. Trends of performance indicators and, and trends of production rates. So you're not just looking at the oil or gas production, as we'll show you in the slides coming ahead. Uh, you're also looking at other uh, indicators and, and other performance measures when you're implementing decline analysis. Basic premise, you need trends or declines for decline analysis. If your well is not declining or there's not a discernible trend, you cannot apply decline analysis. So how do you do it? Uh, you graph the data. You have to understand that there's many different ways that you can, there's many different graphs you can look at to apply decline analysis. Um, the most common graphs or the most common correlations are production rate versus time, production rate versus cumulative production, and water cut versus cumulative production. So these are the three plots that we basically base all of our evaluation work on. 
And again, they're mentioned in our state. So what if you can't use the prime? That's when you're falling back on analogies or volumetric calculations. If you don't have constant operating conditions or your well is not exhibiting decline, um, you have to use something else. Again, this is, this is mostly referring to all of the other methods that we've either discussed or will be discussing this afternoon. Uh, if, a, if a well isn't declining, there's a number of reasons why that might be the case. Um, gas cap or water drive that hasn't broken through. Uh, sometimes you'll see plateaued rates or constant production rates for a long period of time in a reservoir that has uh, strong drive mechanisms. Uh, you might have a very productive well, so if if wells come on, we talked a little bit about infrastructure constraints in an area. If you have, if your wells are capable of delivering much more production than the infrastructure can handle in the area, uh, and you you're not fully what they call pumping off the well, if you're not if you're not allowing the well to deliver its full potential, that's going to mask your underlying decline of the reservoir because you're not drawing down enough to see the actual reservoir performance. So that may show up. Um, best case scenario, you're going to have a plateau, you're going to have a constant rate as your bottom hole pressure slowly declines over time, but your rate stays constant. Worst case scenario, you're going to have a shallower decline, so it might look like you could decline the data, but if you have a changing operating condition in the bottom of your well, decline analysis shouldn't be applied because what's happening is you actually end up with a shallower decline than, than the actual reservoir deliverability, and you could overestimate the reserves. Um, so that basically covers both um, a very productive well, sometimes wells, the multi-stage hydraulic fracturing wells that they're implementing in North America now, they, when they frack, they pump in a whole bunch of sand particles to keep the fractures open after the pressure drops back down. And a lot of times companies will rate restrict their gas wells so that they don't blow back the sand. If they, if they produce too strong or too hard too fast, they can recover a bunch of the sand that they need to prop the fractures open and that has a negative impact on the long-term production potential. So a lot of times in tight oil and gas plays, you'll see companies with wells that are capable of delivering 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 million cubic feet a day initially, but they will rate restrict them to a fraction of that or um, a percentage of that to ensure the integrity of their um, frack profits. So terminology, um, there's a few different ways to look at rate. Monthly oil and gas is, is just the total volume of oil and gas produced in the month. Then we get into calendar day versus operating day rates. So a calendar day rate is the total monthly oil and gas production divided by the number of days in a month, whereas the operating day is only divided by the number of hours on production times 24. So a lot of times in oil and gas production, you have on-time issues, your well is down for certain parts of the month because you have pump failures, you have uh, production issues, you have infrastructure issues. So on times are rarely 100%. They're usually in the high 90s, but um, the difference between calendar day and operating day rates can be substantial. And they do impact things like royalty calculations in Canada. And they also impact, um, for, certain, for certain types of assets, you should be looking at calendar day. And to, to evaluate the net present value of an asset, you have to take into account the on time of the wells because time matters for discounting. Um, for evaluating the total potential or the total reserves, you're generally going to be looking at operating day rates because they're usually a better indication of the deliverability of the reservoir. But there are some exceptions to that because if you have significant downtime, um, it can allow the, the reservoir to stabilize to an extent. It can allow a pressure buildup in the reservoir while the well shut in and that can, that can enhance the performance of the well when you turn, first turn it back on. So these are all factors that you need to take into account when you're trying to apply something like decline analysis. You have to look at, these are the other factors. This is on time, uh, water production. There's, there's a number of factors that we'll go through that you have to understand as you're forecasting the
Okay, so some more terminology. So total fluid is um, can be in cases like water floods. You'll often take a, a, a look at the total fluid rates at the same time you're looking at. So total fluid means um, oil and water, basically. So if you have if you have a high water cut reservoir or you you're operating a water flood, you generally want to have an idea of the total fluid withdrawals coming out of the reservoir because they're a better indication of the reservoir deliverability than just the oil or the water because the the water cut or the oil cut can shift significantly just because water is produced preferentially to oil in reservoirs. Again, water cut and oil cut, like I was just talking about, a lot of times when you're when you're evaluating something like a water flood or a chemical flood, you're going to pay a lot of attention to oil cuts and water cuts. Water oil ratio, uh, this is for both gas and oil. Um, again, high oil cut production, you're gonna pay attention to your water oil ratio. Um, in both oil and gas, when you start to see sharply increasing trends in water oil ratio, that's usually a bad sign for your well. So if you have a spiking water oil ratio, you're probably nearing the end of your well. And that can be, that can show up as a catastrophic failure uh, on the production side. So you could have a gas well, um, just like this one, that's chugging along for 10 years on this decline trend. And then all of a sudden, in a matter of days or weeks, the production can shut right in because it can water out. Gas oil ratio, when you are operating something like a water flood, water flood, you, you're trying, well, water flood is a pressure maintenance scheme in a reservoir. So if you start to see your gas oil ratio rising when you're operating a water flood, you know that you're not maintaining the pressure that you need to, you're not injecting enough fluid. So again, gas oil ratio can be an indication of things that are happening in the reservoir and help you better operate your oil wells. Gas oil ratio obviously only applies to oil production. On time or hours on, that's just the total number of wells that a well actually produces in a month uh, in Alberta and Canada. Along with their production data, um, producers are required to disclose their on time, their number of hours they produce. And another thing you'll often look at when you're, when you're forecasting groups of wells, you'll often put the well count on the forecast. Because another thing that can, if you're forecasting groups of wells, there's, there's another number of precautions you need to take to make sure you're looking at the right data. Fluctuating well counts um, are not a good thing for decline analysis. If, if you're bringing wells on or shutting wells in, uh, you really can't apply decline analysis properly because the new production from those wells or the shutting production is going to create changes in your decline trend that again are not representative of the reservoir performance. So just to give you a better idea, there's going to be a few graphs um, to show you what things look like. So when I talked about catastrophic failure of a gas well, that's really what we're looking at here. So you got a gas well that was chugging along um, and it looks like a million cubic feet a day for a long period of time. You can see the blue line is the water oil ratio. So you can see over time um, the water rate was starting to rise significantly. And then all of a sudden, what happens here is you hit, a, you hit a critical flow path where the gas can no longer lift all the water that's coming out of the reservoir, and your water, your well basically just shuts in. At that point, you have a few options. You can go into the well bore, clean out the water, which is essentially what they do here. You can see they shut on the production, and then they try to restart the well. So they shut in the production, they clean out the well bore, and then they try and um, restart the gas production, and you can see they got a bit of gas. But that was basically the end of the well. So you can see if you were only looking at, <clears throat> if you were forecasting these gas reserves and you were only looking at the gas rate, you would have completely missed this water oil, water gas ratio trend. Um, and you, you basically, you probably would have been just declining a forecast through this trend and you, you would have significantly overestimated the reserve. So as it says up here, this is a strong water drive reservoir. So as an evaluator, 
you need to know going into this evaluation what type of reservoir and what type of drive mechanism you're looking at because in a strong water drive reservoir, this is going to happen to almost every single one of your wells at the end of their life. Your wells are not going to decline out to a nice final um, abandonment pressure. They're going to fail catastrophically <coughs> most of the time. And you need to have an idea of when that happens in the reservoir. So this is the same well shown on a different plot. So the last plot was a rate time. So we saw it over time and, and you could see this is rate cum. So this is this is production rate against cumulative production. This is the plot we actually use for decline forecasting. So this is the plot that we would draw a decline trend through to estimate estimated ultimate recoverable volume. Um, you can see they plotted the water gas ratio again, or the yeah, it's the water gas ratio. Uh, the interesting thing you can see between these two charts, and another thing that you have to keep in mind when you're evaluating, is on a rate time, you can see these breaks. You can see when the well was shut in. You can you have a it kind of highlights the fact that the company has done something to that well. On a rate cum, um, it doesn't. It's it's independent of time, so you cannot see this is where they shut in that well. You you don't know that unless you're looking at both plots. So that's why you want to have more than one graph or plot, and you want to be looking at a lot of different types of data at the same time when you're forecasting. So here's an offshore oil well uh, with offset water injection. So it's not, it's sort of a water flood, but what this is probably saying is it's probably re-injecting produced water into an aquifer um, in order to maintain pressure in the reservoir. So you can see it's very high water cut production. Um, it looks like it's about 93, 94% water cut. So that means for every hundred barrels of fluid that come out of the well, only five or six of those barrels are actually oil. Um, you can see a nice stable decline trend, and they've also got your gas oil ratio in red along the bottom. Again, on the, on the rate time plot, you can see when they've shut in the well. So you can see it, it actually watered out at this point. The, uh, the water cut went to 100%. Oil production dropped to zero. They clearly shut the well in. They went in. They cleaned the well bore out. They might have uh, they might have perforated additional intervals. They might have gone a little bit up hole. They did something, and then they turned the well back on. And you can see they got another uh, six or seven years of production up to this point. So how are they forecasting this? They're showing you um, this is essentially an oil cut forecast. They're forecasting on water cut. Um, but in very high, uh, in very high water cut applications or very low oil cut applications, you'll often see uh, almost no change in the oil rate over time. You'll see, uh, you'll often see they, they continue to increase the total fluid and keep the oil rate, so you'll have a very shallow decline. And the way you forecast ultimate performance is you look at the increasing water cut and you forecast the increasing water cut to a terminal rate or conversely, you forecast a decreasing oil cut to a economic rate, or an economic limit, I should say. You can see they've got two different forecasts on the same trend, so this is, this is where we start to get into uncertainty. So you can see their P plus P estimate takes a bit of a longer trend into account and is shallower, whereas their 1P forecast takes a very aggressive or conservative approach to the water cut. And down here you can see the difference in EURs between 1P and 2P. And again, you can see the actual oil forecast matches pretty well as well. So you can see the oil forecast they're taking into uh, a longer time frame into account for their EUR. And on the 2P, they're only looking at the last year or 18 months. So limitations of decline analysis. Uh, they're valid for only the depletion phase of production. Um, so big issue in low perm reservoirs. So that's that's exactly what I was talking about over here. Um, all of the value in drilling this shale gas well is in this initial transient phase. Um, the decline trend on tight gas wells, um, especially early in development, has very little relevance. Um, this 
conventional gas reservoir is in the depletion phase immediately. It's a giant tank. Uh, as soon as you turn it on and you start depleting the pressure in the reservoir, it's already in the depletion phase. Uh, and on the on the seg D or the heavy oil, you don't really get into the depletion phase until you get to the blowdown in seg D or heavy oil. The reason you're not in a depletion phase in an unconsolidated heavy oil is because when you're producing from an unconsolidated formation, uh, you are producing a significant amount of sand, and it's like a small mining operation inside the reservoir, something that we call wormholes develop as you produce the production. And what they do is they propagate outwards from the wellbore, and they continue to expand the boundary of your production. So the profile you get it's not, it's not depleting because it's not boundary dominated. It continues to expand, and that's the plateau. So it continues to expand its wormhole network until a certain point of time where it reaches its limit and it no longer produces as much sand and it no longer propagates its wormhole network. And at that point, that's the only time in unconsolidated heavy oil that you could forecast a decline. And decline analysis doesn't really apply to unconsolidated heavy oil because at the point that it stops propagating, it usually collapses. And it usually, that's usually within one to two months, unconsolidated heavy oil producers will usually go from plateauing at, at high rates, it could be hundreds of barrels a day, to being shut in. <coughs> It's also limited to constant bottom hole pressure. So this is what I was talking about when I said when they, when they don't draw down completely on wells, when you don't have constant bottom hole conditions, the fundamentals for decline analysis do not apply. I run into issues with that with clients all the time where they will be looking at the production plots of wells and declining them, uh, but not looking at the bottom hole pressure uh, of the wells, and when you take a look at the bottom hole pressure, if you see declining bottom hole pressure, you know that decline analysis is going to end up in uh, with optimistic results because it's going to shallow the decline of your production trend. And it's only valid for the current flow regime. Mechanical problems can cause false declines. Um, like I just talked about, it's, it's not applicable to unconsolidated sands. And sometimes you can have very large differences between operating day and calendar day rates, and depending on which, there's, there's issues with forecasting on either if you have uh, poor on time. Concerns for natural gas wells. Um, compression is a big one. Compression uh, fundamentally changes the operating conditions of your wells. So compression, installing compression on gas wells will cause a stepwise change in production form. So if you're producing a gas field, generally when you first turn on your, your wells, you're going to have relatively high production rates and you're going to have no issues and you're going to chug along until you hit a certain point where your gas wells or the energy in your reservoir is struggling to either lift the fluids or it's, it's not giving you the deliverability or the productivity you're looking for. So what companies will do is they'll install compression into their gathering systems to reduce the back pressure on the wells. And when you install compression, what will happen is you'll get a stepwise jump in your production rate because you're, you're, you're again, um, you're lowering the pressure differential between your wellhead and your reservoir. So your deliverability increases and your productivity increases. And then it'll start declining again on a similar trend. But the, the peril with decline analysis is if you were declining the original trend, you might go to there. And if you start if you start applying decline analysis without understanding that they've installed compression, what you're likely to do is give them a bunch of incremental reserves. But the fundamental reservoir has not changed. The, the, the properties of the reservoir you're dealing with has not changed. So what is more likely to happen is you will see a steeper decline to the same ultimate recoverable volume. Now you, you generally do get a little bit of incremental reserves with compression, 
But that has to do with your, excuse me, your abandonment pressure. So the abandonment pressure before you install compression is going to be some number. Uh, so this is going to be your UI. This is when the well is actually going to shut in. As soon as you install compression, you can draw down your well bore to a lower abandonment pressure. So your new abandonment pressure with compression is going to be some lower value. And your new estimated ultimate recoverable is going to be a bigger number. So you do end up getting more reserves, but it's not because the deliverability of your reservoir changed. It's because you changed the operating conditions of your management pressure. Yeah, same thing. Well, hold, well head flowing pressure and downhole pressure. I refer to downhole pressure a lot. Um, there are you know, producers, it's more common for producers to record pressure at the well head. Um, it's more accurate to produce it downhole. But they're, they're essentially, all you have to do is adjust for the depth and the fluid type that's in the well bore. So it's the same thing. Well head flowing pressure and downhole pressure is the same thing. Facility access and pipelines, obviously, um, you can have, you can actually have the opposite effect of what I just described if you have infrastructure constraints. So instead of a stepwise jump, if all of a sudden you're, you're producing this field and then you bring on five or six large wells and you start to increase the pressure in your gathering system because you have more gas, you'll have the opposite effect where you'll see a stepwise drop in production and same thing, it's probably not going to impact, it's not changing the deliverability of your well, it's changing the operating conditions. So your, your ultimate recoverable volume is likely the same, but if you ignore the abandonment pressure, uh, you're not going to get any, you're going to recover your reserves over a longer period of time, but you're probably going to recover the same volume of reserves. And uh, in some jurisdictions, some jurisdictions are better than others, but sometimes production is not measured accurately. Production often isn't the issue. Uh, things like pressure data can be a big issue. Um, production is usually pretty good, especially in Canada and the US, but uh, other data can be... Uh, not as good quality. <coughs> And production data can be an issue as well. Sometimes when you have a lot of wells in an area, often producers will not account for production on a well-by-well -well basis. You might have 500 shallow gas wells in a pool, and the way the producer will allocate production to the individual wells is based on um, once a month or once every couple months, they'll go around to every well and test the rate. And then all they'll do for the next 30 days or the next 60 days is they'll use the rate to allocate production back to the total gas <coughs> that's coming out of the field. So when, when producers do that, um, because you're not measuring the rate of each gas well on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll often see stepwise jumps up and down and production trends, which obviously is problematic for forecasting individual declines. What you generally do in that case, if it's really bad, uh, is you will group all the wells that are being allocated to out of the same stream and you'll forecast them as a group and it will take care of those um, month to month to bi monthly changes. Okay, so there's two types of equations that are generally applied for decline analysis. You have curve fitting, which it goes back to ARPS, it goes back to formulas. And then you have type curve matching, which is what I was talking about with the which this is fairly detailed. Um, we won't be spending a lot of time talking about the differences. 95% um, of the time, you're looking at the ARPS curve fitting scenario. So this is the ARPS equation for curve fitting. Um, Q is rate. So the rate at any time is equal to the initial rate um, times 1 plus a decline exponent times the initial decline rate, uh, times time, and then there's an inverse relationship with the decline exponent. So Arpsefetkovich, so the decline exponent, be there, there's a lot of, the decline exponent, uh, it basically describes the curvature of your production. So if we go back to, this plot, the decline exponent 
in shale gas in the transient phase is very high. It's, this says between zero and one. Um, we'll see a few slides later that it can actually be greater than one due to operational constraints. So this, in this initial phase, you have a very high decline exponent, which means you have very high curvature in your production. Uh, this is exponential. This is, this is a decline exponent of zero. And then something like this is going to be in between. And almost all production, uh, almost all reservoir deliverability actually falls. Um, you very rarely see exponential production, and you very rarely see uh, long-term harmonic or super harmonic. So you, you very rarely see values of one or greater than one for mature decline trends, and you very rarely see wells that are actually exponential. So why are there three types? The three types being exponential, harmonic, and hyperbolic. Um, originally, the, the people who came up, the Arps, when he came up with the equation, he didn't really have an explanation for it. He just said, that's what we're seeing, so it, it just is. Um, we now know it's related to relative perm effects in the reservoir um, and presence of gas in the pores of the rock. So you're getting, you're getting gas production from uh, multiple sources in the reservoir. So this is showing you three different types of uh, production forecasts. It's got exponential, hyperbolic, and harmonic. And what this is really showing you is that if you have the same EUR, um, exponential forecasts are going to give you the greatest value. They're going to recover the reserves in the quickest amount of time. Um, so it's showing you that the exponential forecast ends in 35 years, the hyperbolic forecast ends in 45 years, and the harmonic ends in 55 years. So if you, this is, this is essentially a rate Q plot. If you saw it on a rate time plot, the straight line would end 10 years before the middle line, which would end 10 years before the final line. And because of the time value of money, that tells you that exponential trends are going to give you the best value. This is what they look like on semi-log. So semi-log um, logarithmic plots have, they have a log scale on one side, um, and they basically invert what the forecast looked like. So a harmonic curve is a straight line on a semi-log plot and an exponential curve is a downwards trending um, curve on the same plot. So this plot and the plot before it are the exact same curve, or the exact same data and forecast, uh, but shown in two different ways. And evaluators generally don't use semi-logs unless they're forecasting well. So just putting that into words and comparing the shapes, exponential plots is a straight line on semi-log rate time and an arithmetic rate cube. So we didn't show you the rate time, we were showing you rate cube, but there's an, the, the relationships are flipped again if you're looking at time versus cube. Uh, Exponential is widely used because it's very easy when people are building models and spreadsheets or doing calculations by hand, exponential is the easiest one to forecast by a wide margin. Uh, it's called the constant percentage decline because your effective decline rate at any point in time uh, is always the same. If you, if you assume your decline rate is 10% on a well, for an exponential curve that, that decline rate never changes, it's always 10%. Whereas if you're looking at hyperbolic or harmonic, um, if you assume your initial decline rate is 10%, um, six months later or a year later, you're going to have a different decline rate that's going to be shallower. It's going to be 8% or 7%. Exponential forecasts are the most conservative from a volume perspective. As I said, uh, from a value perspective, they recover the volumes in the shortest amount of time, given the same EUR. But when you're forecasting a trend, Exponential will always give you the lowest volume compared to hyperbolic or harmonic. Hyperbolic is a modestly flattening curve on a rate cube plot. And most wells, pretty much all the wells you see will, will have some, they will fall into the hyperbolic category. 
They're saying the exponent for most wells is between 0.2 and 0.5, and as we, as I showed you earlier, the, the full it could be between zero and, and one, but most wells fall between 0.2 and 0.5. Harmonic uh, steeper curve uh, or a more quickly flattening curve on a linear plot, or it's a straight line on semi log like we saw. It's the most optimistic, and it's rarely observed in, in conventional plays. So it really, it's harmonic, when it's used in conventional analysis, is usually used to get an idea of the maximum limit of a well. Uh, a term called superharmonic means an n of greater than 1. Like I said, this isn't a reservoir phenomena. This is more how wells are operated for the most part. Uh, we see it in unconventional and tight plays, but only in the transient phase, only in that first year, two years, three years. Uh, it has very dramatic curvature, and it's difficult to predict, usually because it's on a very steep de initial decline, and it's got very high curvature. So just to summarize that in a simple table, exponential, exponent zero, it's got the lowest reserves volume, but it's got the maximum rate of recovery. It recovers it the quickest. Hyperbolic is in between and uh, has a ex uh, decline exponent between 0 and 1. Harmonic with a decline exponent of 1 uh, recovers the maximum volume, but it takes the longest time to recover that volume. Consolidated and unconsolidated sands. So I'm, we're going to show you a few examples of oil production from consolidated and unconsolidated. These are both zones. You're going to see a few production plots. They're both from the exact same well. So there are two different types of zones that were completed at two different times in the well's life. Um, it's saying there's six oil zones total within the well. So we, we have a lot of reservoirs in Canada that are stacked. So you have separate accumulations in different layers. And you can uh, produce oil and or gas from all of them, uh, either commingled at the same time or uh, separately as you move up hole. Uh, what is an unconsolidated sand? So it means that your sandstone grains are not cemented. Um, sand production is inevitable. When you have an unconsolidated sand, you know you're going to bring sand out with the oil, which can cause operational issues because um, you're basically running sandpaper through your well bore uh, on a daily basis. So it's very hard on um, your well bore mechanics and your infrastructure. The oil really, until the development of a technology called progressive cavity pumps, unconsolidated stands were, were basically avoided. It was impossible to recover commercial volumes uh, until PC pumps became a thing. So here's a consolidated sand. Uh, Lloyd Minster zone, so this is heavy oil in Alberta. Um, you can see consolidated sand, uh, you have a normal decline trend, basically saying you're, you're hitting a boundary at some point and your reservoir energy is depleting over time. Uh, you can see it, it recovered 20,000 barrels in eight years and you could use decline analysis on this well. Here's an unconsolidated sand, um, sparky zone, so this is just below the Lloyd Minster. Um, produces heavy oil, so the same oil as the other one. You can see the oil rate increasing. This is what I was talking about when I was saying it was developing a wormhole network. Um, so basically, the pressure drawdown in the well bore continues to uh, produce sand, which is in essence uh, almost like a mining operation inside, on a, on a very small scale inside the producing formation. Uh, it continues to expand its network and it continues to access more and more reservoir, which is why you don't see any depletion. You see it actually ramping up. And then all of a sudden, uh, the wormhole network collapses and the well fails catastrophic. There are reservoirs um, that are being produced right now. There's a couple very large reservoirs where they've gone back into the well bores and they do this quite often. They'll go back in, they'll reperforate, and they'll try and bring the well back on production. And success rates are actually quite high. And you could, you could, you could actually have this exact same trend over again. It just depends on how the wormhole network uh, propagated from your well bore. 
obviously there's there's no declinable trend. So when you're when you're evaluating wells like this, you're looking at analogs. You're looking at average recoveries for other wells in the area like this, or you're looking at volumetric methods and an average recovery factor that you've seen on hundreds of other wells uh, just like this one in similar reservoirs in the same area. So getting into some more examples of decline analysis, so uh, we'll look at a Monty, a turbidite Monty well. So a turbidite geological term just means sediment deposited by gravity in deep water. So Monty is not a true shale, it's sort of interbedded sand, silt, stone, and shale, so it's a little bit of a better reservoir than a true shale. Uh, permeability is still very, very low, 0 0.001 millidarcies. Uh, we'll be, this well that we're going to be looking at has a 10 stage fracture treatment. So, this would have been one of the earlier wells um, on production in Canada. 10 stages is fairly low. They're now doing 20 to 30 stages in most wells. Uh, and they're saying it had a facility access problem. So, there's likely going to be some operational constraints early in the life of the well. Uh, and they're talking about, they're saying the decline is likely going to be hyperbolic because you know it is a tight gas. So here's what it looks like. Uh, you sort of you can get a sense for calendar day versus producing day. This well has pretty good on time. There's not a lot of separation between the dotted line and the solid line. That's calendar day versus producing day rates. Um, producing day rates or operating day rates is always going to be your higher curve. So you you know that best case scenario you have 100% on time and your calendar day matches your producing day. But as soon as your on time is below 100%, your calendar day rate is always going to be lower. And you can see when they're talking about initially they had facility issues, you can see the, the massive difference in producing day and calendar rates in the first two months. So in the first month, uh, the calendar day rate was about 1,400 MCF a day, but the actual deliverability of the reservoir for the days it was able to produce was more than double that. And same with the second month. So initially, they could not produce the well for very long in a month due to facility concerns. This is a poor example of a decline. We wouldn't be, if we were forecasting this well, this is, this is what you might do if you weren't familiar with the type of asset you're looking at. If you weren't familiar with uh, monotony production and what a monotony well generally looks like, we know that all monotony wells, barring serious issues with the completion, are going to have a general trend that looks like that. So forecasting an exponential decline in a relatively early phase of the well's life is going to be incredibly conservative. We know that this well is going to continue to curve unless it runs into some sort of catastrophic or operational failure. Here's a semi-log plot of the exact same data. Um, I should caution that when I, when I flip through some of these pages, some of the plots have been shifted up or down, but the T-Cline curve didn't get shifted. So sometimes you'll see um, some odd gaps between forecasts. This isn't actually one of them. This is just showing that you could, you could extrapolate a much larger trend and figure out what you, what you thought was a reasonable decline for the, uh, the reservoir deliverability. And then when you got the rate increase due to, this is probably an operational change, they went in, they did something in the well barn and got a spike in production. Um, so all they've done is they've taken the decline trend and they've shifted it up to the new production rates. So talking about operational changes, so there's a very good example of a bunch of things that can happen in a well. So initially, you can see the well is constrained. Uh, this well is, if it's flat for this long, you know that it's capable of delivering higher rates than what it's producing at. Uh, this is saying it was facility constrained early in the life, which isn't surprising because this is, they were basically constrained at three or four million a day, which is a pretty high gas rate. They're saying anytime you can see that gap between producing day and calendar day, you know there's on time issues, the well's been shut in for a significant period uh, within a given month. And then they're, they're showing a stepwise change in production. So again, something has happened operationally. This is not a reservoir phenomenon. Re reservoirs don't have, nature in general does not have stepwise changes. 
Uh, anytime you see uh, a stepwise drop or increase, either the operator has done something or something is happening with the infrastructure in the area. So go running through an example. Um, back to volumetric calculations, so you have an idea of the original oil in place. So they're saying this is an edge water drive oil pool example. Um, they're defining a bunch of parameters. Uh, this is the production forecast for the pool. So it's your oil rate versus cumulative oil produced. So this is one of the forecasts that got shifted. Um, but you can see exactly what it was. It was a little bit higher. Um, very declinable trend. And very exponential. So this is the same data on a semi-log plot. So they're creating two estimates here. Um, they're using, they're, they're doing an oil forecast, which is the upper line, um, to a final value. The, the economic limit there is 20 barrels of oil per day. And they're also doing an oil cut forecast and choosing an economic limit based on oil cut, which they're saying is 3%. So that means that 97% of the fluid being produced from this well when they shut it in will be water. And the reason sometimes it's um, relevant to forecast oil cut limits is because there's a direct relation between operating costs and how much water handling you have in a, in a high water cut reservoir. So a lot of uh, edge water drive, water flood, or uh, bottom water drive reservoirs, um, their economic limits are going to be determined by how much water the operator has to deal with along with the oil. So this is showing you there's about a 20% difference in the ultimate recoverable estimate between the two methods. So if you were just forecasting the um, oil production and you chose an economic limit that you thought was reasonable at 20 barrels a day, which I can tell you is extremely high, nobody's going to shut in a well at 20 barrels a day in Canada. Um, you would end up with 8,400 barrels, and if you did the oil cut forecast to what you thought was a reasonable limit based on total fluid rate, you would get almost 20% more volume. So this is talking about the volumetric estimate that we had. So there's the one slide that had all the volumetric parameters. So if you went through and, and ran the calculation, you would have gotten 48 million barrels in place. Um, the recovery from the initial forecast was roughly 10%. Um, and the recovery from semi-log, we forecasted two of them. So that, that's going back to the... So this is the first recovery it's talking about that uh, should be a little bit higher, but they're saying you get about 5 million barrels. This is the second recovery. The reason that this forecast is, is different and significantly higher, so we have 5 million barrels on the first plot, we have 8.4 8 million barrels on the second plot. Because this is a semi-log plot, a straight line on a semi-log is a harmonic decline. So this is that n equals 1. So if, if you saw this on a, um, on a normal plot, not a semi-log plot, this would be the very high curvature forecast. So that's comparing the three. So the, the exponential forecast, 5 million barrels, 10% recovery factor. Um, the harmonic forecast, 17.4% recovery factor. And then the recovery from the oil cut, which is also a harmonic forecast since it was a straight line, 22.3. Uh, so this is showing you a wide range on a very established production decline trend. Um, this, this is very mature. This is easy to decline. And this is showing you that your recovery factor can vary from 10% to 22% depending on what method you apply, which is why you need to you need to understand the fundamentals of applying decline forecast analysis and, and what you're doing. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. There's two different types of decline rates that you'll see in mostly in production software that, that we use these days. Uh, you have effective and nominal declines. I think there's a few slides on how you calculate them. Um, nominal declines are what you'll usually see. Well, what most software programs these days show you both effective and nominal. So this is showing you how you calculate each type. So you have 
true decline or nominal decline as well as the effective decline rate. Uh, again, not critical um, to know the difference in these for your purposes. So water drive, oil field, pool conclusions. So I was asking you to calculate an RLI based on that first plot, that first exponential decline plot, the RLI of, of 12.9 years. So this is, that's a relatively high RLI. So, so reserve life index is one of those metrics that you can look at in, in wells and reservoirs and fields uh, to get an idea of how aggressive or conservative the reserves might be. Um, in a mature water flood that produces a very high oil cuts, you can have higher RLIs because they produce at low rates for a long time. Um, but this is just another, another check on the performance of your reserves and the performance of your reservoir. So what this is saying is you have a very high RLI, which means it's going to take you a long time to get your oil out of the ground. Um, so you could look at implementing something that will accelerate your production, like infill drilling, like water flooding, um, pressure maintenance schemes. Um, it's then saying the oil cut decline shows higher recovery, so that's that range between 10 and 20 percent we were talking about, um, which means there's the potential for drilling infill wells in that field or play. So tight rocks, so getting into unconventional tight gas, tight oil, Again, that, that initial phase of flow, the transient phase of flow, you, you have to know what you're looking at. If you, if you apply decline analysis in, in this phase, um, you could end up, you would be significantly underestimating most likely because you're in a very high decline phase initially and you're generally going to underestimate your ultimate reserves. It's talking about the super harmonic, the high curvature phase that we use at the beginning of tight gas or tight oil plays. And as I was discussing for timeline, the transient phase can last for years. We're seeing some of the tightest reservoirs, we're seeing five, six, seven years of transient flow. So five, six, seven years of high curvature flow. And that can have a, a large impact on your EUR. It has less of an impact on your MPV. So how do we forecast them? Multi-stage declines are very common. Um, so we're showing very large differences in decline trends early in the well life. And then later in the well life, um, in most of these plays, we actually haven't seen the long-term performance of the wells. When we're, when we're evaluating tight oil and gas, a lot of the times our estimates for the long-term performance is based on vertical wells that produced out of the same reservoirs um, a long time ago. Wells that were much less prolific. We'll, we'll take a look at the vertical wells and see what the uh, long-term or terminal decline rates were. And we'll assume that the horizontal wells in that same reservoir, in that same formation, will exhibit similar trends uh, once they hit the long-term boundary dominated flow. So how do you fit declines? Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at production trends and fitting them uh, visually. Or you can use be best fit regressions on the computer. So this is, this is the computer running a set of calculations to find the mathematically correct um, fit. To find the fit that has the lowest deviation from the actual data. Um, we generally don't use best fit regressions. Uh, for decline analysis, we will almost always be using a visual approach and applying decline analysis. Should you be using exponential, hyperbolic, or harmonic? It depends on the asset you're looking at. It depends on the type of reservoir you're in. Uh, wells often show compound declines, so that's talking again, much like the tight gas reservoirs where you will have a uh, transient phase and then a boundary dominated phase where you may have uh, harmonic or super harmonic into hyperbolic and then maybe into exponential in the long term. Um, how we generally do it, we usually match the actual performance of the wells in the area. Um, we, we choose a curvature that matches the actual production. Uh, so we, we, we let the performance dictate what the decline exponent should be. It says never use B greater than 0.8, so that's talking about, especially in conventional reservoirs, you shouldn't be using high curvature for long-term declines. You very rarely see <laughs> high curvature um, in the depletion stage of production. And exponential declines may understate reserves. 
as I said earlier, we use exponential a lot for proof uh, because it is a conservative estimate. Almost all production has some amount of curvature. So this is ARP's views on which decline exponents to use. He spent a lot of time looking at a lot of different wells and, uh, and analyzing the production trends. Uh, this was a long time ago, but most of it still rings true today. He very rarely saw exponential declines. Uh, he very rarely saw harmonic declines. Again, back in those days, they didn't have the tight, unconventional gas reservoirs we have now. Tight gas and oil, so he, he almost never saw harmonic. So when he was looking at the time frame that he was analyzing the data, his B values were between 0 and 0 0.7. 90% of the wells he looked at had exponents less than 0.5. 15% uh, were less than 0.1, so three quarters of all of the wells he looked at fell between 0.1 and 0.5. So again, that's a big principle. That's just saying that if you're looking at oil and gas wells in the depletion phase of production, uh, the vast majority of them are going to fall into the 0.1 to 0.5 range. Uh, Fekovich, so this was the other decline analysis expert uh, who's a little more recent. He said you can find exponential declines in undersaturated oil reservoirs, oil wells with high GORs or poor water flood performance. And that's usually telling you that um, some other mechanism in the, re in the reservoir is impacting the relative permeability of your production fluids. Um, so that's why you get very conservative uh, oil production trends that actually follow exponential decrease. Uh, B of point 0.3 he, he found was very common for solution gas drive reservoirs. So we see a lot of wells in Canada uh, in the 0.3 to 0 0.5 range. 0 0.5, gravity drainage, full water drive. Uh, these are areas that have a lot of, or reservoir types that have a lot of pressure support. They generally see the higher curvature. Decline analysis of water floods. Um, you can only use decline analysis in mature phases of water floods, and there's, you have to know what you're doing. Water floods can be complicated to properly evaluate. Um, these are things you need to look out for. Different project areas, well counts and well additions, so you need a constant well count. You always want to keep an eye on total fluid production. Um, as a general concept, the reason you want to always be aware of total fluid production on your well is because you may have, if you were just looking at uh, your oil rate, your oil rate may be exhibiting a nice decline. But if you're, if you're looking at this well and you're looking at your total fluid rate and your total fluid rate is, is actually climbing over time, what's happening is your oil cut is dropping and your water cut is increasing so your total fluid is increasing. So if you just forecast this trend you're going to overestimate your reserves because at some point there's going to be a physical limit to how much fluid they can handle or how much fluid they can produce. And when that limit comes, when all of a sudden, uh, sorry, I drew it too high. If this is your total fluid trend, when when you start to hit that physical limit or you can no longer handle the water because your facilities can no longer handle it, so all of a sudden your total fluid has to has to flatten, what's gonna happen to your decline curve is it's gonna shrug. It's it's gonna come down um, much more sharply than you would forecast. So so if you have an increasing fluid cut, it's gonna shallow your oil decline because it's masking the effect of your oil cut. So you need to forecast those types of wells based on oil cut or water cut as opposed to declining the production trend. And on water floods, 90% uh, of the time when you're evaluating water floods, you're going to be looking at group plots to understand uh, a, a wider view of the water flood. And group plots can be challenging. There, there's a, a number of pitfalls in group plots. So jumping right into group plots. So decline analysis, what is a group plot? It, it's a group of wells um, with that are under the same recovery mechanism, the same reservoir that you group together in order to, there's, there's a number of reasons you would do it. Uh, we talked about production allocation issues in certain fields earlier. Uh, water floods are another good example. 
Um, generally speaking, wells in the same reservoir are, are always going to be somewhat dependent on one another. So sometimes grouping those wells can give you uh, a better view of total reservoir performance than looking at them individually. So why are they problematic? There's no theoretical basis. ARPS equations, Vectorvich curves, they don't apply to group plots. They, they apply to individual wells because as soon as you start aggregating wells and combining wells, um, the fundamental reservoir physics get masked by the individual performance of a number of wells, unless you normalize the wells. But when we're doing group forecasting, you're not normalizing to a certain point in time. Again, we see the 80-20 rule coming up, where generally a few wells will dominate the performance of an area. Um, and things like changing well counts, things like changing total fluid rates can mask the true decline of the production. So again, you have to use caution, you have to know what you're doing when you're forecasting on group plots. The basic premise for material balance is that when hydrocarbons are produced from a reservoir, poor volume must be filled by expansion of oil, rock, gas, water, individually or in comp combination. So you have to have some sort of expansion to fill the space. Or you have to have an influx of gas or water into that space to replace or a combination of the two. So this is, this is talking about drive mechanisms. So for oil reservoirs, you need good fluid property production and pressure data, and you must have produced at least 10% of the oil in place below the bubble point to get an accurate calculation. So these are these are fairly stringent conditions. This is why this is why we don't use material balance a lot. You have to be uh, you have to have a very mature pool in a very mature stage of production. Uh, just a simple definition. Bubble point is the is the pressure at which solution gas starts to evolve in oil. So we don't see material balance a lot in oil reservoirs because you have to be you have to essentially be in a stage where you're comfortable doing decline analysis anyways. Where material balance is a little more applicable is in gas reservoirs. So we do see it used sometimes in, in gas reserve estimation. Um, but you do need some pretty, again, you need some high quality data to be confident in your material, material balance estimates. Uh, and they can get quite complex depending on the number of drive mechanisms that are present in the reservoir. So some of the more complex ones require computer programs with complex software, um, which are essentially pseudo simulations. One of the more simple methods for material balance is what's called the P over Z method. Uh, again, pressure, is, or P is referring to pressure and Z is referring to the compressibility factor we talked about in the OJIP calculations. Um, so it only applies to volumetric natural gas reservoirs, so that, that means it has to be um, a, a relatively simple reservoir. It has to be a tank style reservoir. In theory, it's a straight line relationship between P over Z and cumulative production. Uh, it applies to a full pool. It, it's not really useful for individual wells in a multi-well pool. So you have, to, you have to take the pressure and compressibility information for the pool as a whole. And again, you need significant production pressure history to have uh, a meaningful trend to forecast. This is showing you, in, in a somewhat ideal case, what it would look like. So you've got your initial reservoir pressure and your initial gas deviation or gas compressibility factor. And this is just showing the change to pressure and gas deviation factor over time. And it's saying you're going to estimate your ultimate recoverable based on an abandonment pressure, which is something that we've talked about. It's an interesting figure. I'm not actually... Oh, this is talking about um, how you get reservoir pressures. So this is this is stepping back to how they how they um, how they test reservoir pressures. So this is a case study from a real pool in Alberta, uh, Slave Point Pool. So this is just a large gas pool. Uh, the reason it's chosen is because it is uh, a 
very good example of a volumetric gas reservoir um, that has near ideal conditions, which is why you can see these eight or ten data points uh, are very much in the linear trend. So here we're forecasting the linear trend. Um, you can get two things out of a P over Z plot. If you forecast it all the way down to zero, that should be a, a reasonable approximation of the original gas in place in the reservoir. So that's saying if you were able to drop the pressure, pressure in the reservoir uh, all the way to uh, below atmosphere, all the way down to zero PSI, that would mean you would have produced every molecule of gas in the reservoir, and that would be your OJ. These two lines that they're showing, uh, they're talking about different, um, different abandonment pressures. So this is a good example. We talked a little bit about compression earlier and how it could increase your ultimate reserves. So what this is saying is without the installation of compression, uh, a reasonable approximation of abandonment pressure uh, is 1500 PSIA. And if that was your abandonment pressure, you would come across your P over Z curve to your abandonment pressure. And you can see that the Estimated ultimate recoverable gas would be about 225 BCF. By installing compression, you can lower your abandonment pressure by reducing the line pressure on the back end, which allows you to draw down further on the reservoir. And you can see that the changing your abandonment pressure from 1500 PSI to 500 PSI through compression is going to unlock a significant amount of incremental reserve. So it's going from 225 to a little less than 340. Um, so that's another 100, 120 BCF of gas that can be realized just by installing compression. So like I said, the, the material balance doesn't get used a lot, because, especially in oil, because most oil pools have multiple drive mechanisms and each drive mechanism that's present in a material balance calculation adds a significant amount of complexity and it makes it much more difficult to have confidence in the results. There are simple gas reservoirs that can be modeled very effectively with uh, material balance methods, and, and that's what we were looking at with that P over Z plot. On to reservoir simulation. There's only one or two slides on reservoir simulation. Um, it's a powerful tool. Uh, I would argue that it's, it's definitely not essential for estimating reserves. You need to understand reservoir simulation because there are certain, uh, the more complex your reservoir, uh, the more useful reservoir simulation becomes. There are several types of simulators. Uh, black oil just means, uh, when we talk about dead and live oil, black oil is, is a simple oil model. It doesn't, it doesn't model the uh, effects of multiple fluids. It doesn't, it, it'll model oil and water. It doesn't really model the relative perm effects of gas. Compositional starts to model the effects of other fluids. It models relative permeability effects between gas and oil. Uh, and thermal simulations are, are specific to oil sands and bitumen needs. So reservoir simulation in general, I spoke a little bit about it on the first day. Uh, you have to be very careful with the results of reservoir simulation because um, all of the mathematics that go into a dynamic simulation are based on theory and they're based on ideal situations. Um, they, they can be adjusted for complexities and you can adjust them to, um, you can add in factors that allow you to history match for non-perfect reservoirs, but at the end of the day they're still based, the mathematics are still based on, on ideal situations. So generally speaking, reservoir simulations are going to be optimistic because reservoirs uh, never, in practice, reservoirs never react ideally. So reservoir simulation, you need a lot of data and you need good data to have confidence in reservoir simulation results. Uh, you need a full geological characterization of your pool or drainage area. You need to know, you need to have a very good understanding of your properties. 
Uh, gas, oil, and water. You need to understand the relative permeability effects. So relative permeability is, um, is the ability for gas, oil, and water to flow um, sort of in unison. And it is the ability, it's the impact that the flow of gas has on the flow of oil. Uh, the flow of oil has on the flow of water, etc. So relative permeability is describing how different fluids in a reservoir react with one another. Um, you need to have a you need to have enough oil, gas, and water production to the only way you can calibrate a reservoir simulation model is by history matching existing production rates. So to have any confidence, you could run the simulations without any production data to give yourself an idea of what ultimate recoveries might be. But to have any confidence that the results are applicable to your reservoir, you really need to have uh, historical data that you can match. You also need to have uh, good pressure data in your reservoir. Reliable software is available. Um, there's a few major packages uh, put out there by People like Schlumberger, there's a Canadian company called CMG. So there's commercial packages that are um, very widely used internationally for reservoir simulation. So that wraps up the performance methods. Um, the downfall of performance methods, you need performance data. You have to have a relatively, you have to have some maturity in your production. It, it can't be done before you have production data operating in a stable state. The benefit is it can be very accurate. Uh, it's widely used, it's widely recognized, um, but as we've been discussing all these various pitfalls, you need to understand, you need to have a fundamental understanding of the principles of decline analysis to know if you're applying them correctly. So analogy, comparison between one thing and another, typically for the purpose of explanation or clarification, that's probably the Webster's definition. Um, in terms of oil and gas, we're talking about comparison of similar wells or pools um, to ones that have more development and production history. It's essentially a performance prediction or it allows a performance prediction based upon reservoir comparison with a high degree of correlation. And you have to have a lot of different parameters that you understand in both reservoirs to ensure you have a proper analog. Issues with analogy, there's often considerable uncertainty in the estimate. It's, it's never truly known how applicable an analog is to your subject reservoir until you start producing from your subject reservoir. Uh, in general, the, the more similar the reservoir parameters are, and the closer in proximity, and proximity could be geologic age, it could be uh, geographical proximity. Generally, the closer the reservoir, the more similar it's going to be, and the better the, ana the analogy will be. Uh, the last two points are not overly important, the average recovery of offsets. Um, so that's just saying when you're looking at offsets, um, your, your average when you're looking at offsets is what you're going to apply as your best estimate for your analog or your expected outcome. Common types of ana analogs that you'll see all the time in oil and gas evaluations, reserve life index. So we talked a bit about that. That's how long uh, it generally takes based on an init, a current production rate or initial production rate to recover the remaining reserves. So it's, it's fairly simple to get an idea of what a reasonable RLI is in a bunch of different types of plays and, uh, and apply that. So when we looked at those unconsolidated uh, heavy oil wells with the sand production and the wormholes that fail catastrophically, RLI is an easy analog. We'll look at how long the average well produces based on its initial rate, so converted to an RLI. And we know that in a lot of those wells, two to five years is a reasonable RLI for uh, the vast majority of the wells, and so we'll use that as an analog, especially if all we have for the well is the initial rate. It's an easy way to estimate an ultimate recoverable volume. Uh, you'll see analogies of statistical results, so you'll take 
You'll take average parameters from another pool or field and apply them to yours. And especially in Canada, in our unconventional plays, we use a lot of type curves these days. So RLI we talked about, uh, it's your total recoverable reserves over the production rate times 365 days. It comes out as a, as a year's. So this is looking at uh, a couple of different a couple of different parameters in the Montney in Canada. So uh, RLI is the data points in, with solid dots. Um, it's talking about NGL yields for the data points with triangles. And the initial production rates in the second month is the uh, light dots. So these, these are the type of plots where we can um, where we can take average values for parameters like these and start to build an estimate for the undeveloped or undiscovered Montney assets we have nearby. Talking about type curves, uh, a type curve is an idealized well. It's, it's usually an average result, so usually we'll forecast uh, a number of wells for an area of play, and then a type curve is can roughly be approximated as an average of all those wells. It can be very accurate as long as you're, again, you, you need to know uh, whether the subset of wells in your type curve are applicable to your current reservoir. But if, if you type curve appropriately, it can be a very accurate method. It's widely used for unconventional oil and gas plays. Uh, it's been around for a very long time. And it's a very powerful method for evaluating very large assets in a short period of time. So how do we create type curves? Um, we have to have some sort of basis. It can be things like computer <laughs> simulations. It can be things like volumetric calculations. More normally, or more commonly, it's performance of analogous pools and reservoirs or normalized well production. Uh, those last two are what we spend most of our time building type curves on. When preparing type curves, the things you have to keep in mind, things like geology, Permeability, how tight your reservoir is. Uh, well type, whether they're horizontal or vertical, they have very different production profiles. Drilling and completion techniques. We've talked about hydraulic fracturing and, and how different their production profiles can be to normal wells. Number and size of fracks and frac design. So again, a lot of this is tailored towards unconventional asset development in Canada. So uh, as, as time goes on and you start to refine your type curves in an area, when you initially have uh, 10 wells in a development, you might have one type curve for the future development in that area. As you get, as your development matures and you drill more and more wells and you go from 10 wells to 100 wells to 1,000 wells, um, you, your type curving generally gets more complex. You start to find a lot more ways to bin wells and there's a lot more variances in the reservoir and the production profiles. So over time, you typically end up with more type curves, not less. Uh, the example they're pointing to, uh, Monty Gas. So again, we talked quite a bit about the Monty. Uh, the Monty has three layers in Northwest Alberta and Northeast BC, three major layers uh, because it's so thick. It's present in six different areas. Um, as of 2014, when these slides were made, there were 17 type curves that we applied to the various areas, uh, and only one of them was applied in, in multiple areas. Cardium, which is a tight oil play, there's only three areas, three, they're quite large, but three productive areas. Uh, there's 63 type curves that we use in the Cardium, and there's, there's more now, that was, uh, that was a couple years ago. So issues with type curve creation, recognizing well flow regime. So that's when we were talking about um, early time flow versus boundary dominated flow. So that's that's this initial phase versus the long term boundary dominated phase. You have to you have to know uh, you have to be combining wells that have similar flow regimes, profiles in early time, how steep, how long that comes down, and how much data you have on the wells. Uh, which is what it's getting out with long-term performance. If you have, you could have 100 wells, but if you only have six months of data on all 100 wells, uh, you're not going to be able to build a type curve, or at least not a very good type curve. And type curves have to be constantly updated. 
Uh, we spend a lot of our time internally updating type curves. So you can use type curves for things like water floods, thermal projects like say B, so that's steam assisted gravity drainage, and CSS is cyclic steam, it's cyclic steam stimulation. Uh, it can also be used for individual wells, which is, you're, you're talking about monotony, carbon, uh, tight gas, tight oil. So a heavy oil water flood type curve, what it's saying is uh, this might be a single well or this might be a group of wells within a water flood. And this is the situation we were talking about right here where you have to go back to analogs or volumetrics or fundamental understanding of the reservoir to develop a profile for what it looks like when you implement a water flood. If you were going to use an analog, if you had another pool that had implemented a water flood uh, and had a profile like this, you could take this profile. So you can see it's a heavy oil pool, it was almost depleted. They went in, they implemented the water flood, and they got a whole bunch of incremental volume. Uh, if you had another oil pool that was at this stage, and you wanted to implement a water flood project, you could use this as a basis for your production forecast. Um, the, the parameters they're pointing out that would go in your type curve, primary, secondary, and incremental recovery. So if, if you had a brand new pool that you knew was a good analog to this pool, but you hadn't even started primary production, you could actually forecast um, both phases. You could forecast primary based on this and water flood recovery. Uh, you can forecast time to fill up. That's, that's this period here where you're repressuring the reservoir after you've had a lot of primary uh, depletion. So you can forecast how long it will take to repressurize your, your reservoir and duration of water flood plateau. So how long is the production likely to go flat uh, after you see your oil bank? Safety welfares. Um, this is an interesting plot. Um, you can see they don't... <laughs> this is called... Uh, the, the term we have for this in the Canadian industry is called bullheading. So, um, say B, even though it's it doesn't flow naturally a lot of times, you can get marginal rates out of the reservoir without applying steam a lot of the time. And in order to um, get your your steam well, we had talked about Seg D is, is the technology that has two horizontal wells parallel to one another. You inject steam through the top well and you produce oil through the bottom well. Um, what happens is they have a hard time getting the steam in through the top well initially. So what they'll do is they'll either steam a tiny amount or they'll just produce cold production out of the injection well uh, for a period of time prior to injecting steam to make it easier to inject steam into the formation. So that's what this is showing. You have a little bit of essentially primary or cold production uh, in order to improve the injectivity of the steam well born, and then they start steaming. And you get a build up, you get a plateau, and then you get a blowdown or depletion phase. And that profile, especially in say D wells, is very consistent. Yes, SOR is steam well ratio. And so you, you have an instantaneous steam well ratio, so these little lines are an instantaneous steam oil ratio, that's the steam oil ratio for that month. And the red line is the cumulative steam oil ratio. And the cumulative steam oil ratio uh, is a heavy factor in the uh, economic viability of, of any thermal um, project. So heavy oil wells, this goes back to um, Consolidated and unconsolidated heavy oil and type curve. This would be consolidated heavy, consolidated reservoir so that you can actually apply decline analysis. Um, but it's showing you a bunch of bins of wells. So uh, the red bin has 71 wells, the green bin has 46 wells, and the blue bin has 78 wells. Um, these are, they would all be wells in the same general area, but they would have been categorized um, by some criteria. The dots you see are the average of all of the wells normalized to a, a single starting point.
Oh, so this tells you how they've been binned. Uh, they've been binned by oil viscosity. So this is this is the scatter data. This is this is the actual production points from all the wells, and this is the average. So it says there's 78 wells in this production data, and it just shows you that even even from a very wide variety of wells. So you've got your you've got your P10 wells up here. You've got your best wells, and you've got your worst wells at the bottom. Uh, and this is telling you what your average performance ex expectation is for if you were to drill 100 more wells in this same pool and field, this should be a very good representation of what you can expect on average. You're still going to get wells that will exceed it, you'll get wells that will be poorer than it, but on average, when you have a data set that big, it's statistically significant enough that it should be a good representation of future drilling potential. This is uh, uh, the production profile for a Viking horizontal well. Again, it's another semi-unconventional play. It's not as tight as some of the other ones, uh, but it is horizontal multi-stage fracturing. So we're going to run you through a Monty type curve. So you can see there's only six or seven wells here. Um, well, these, these aren't wells. These are actually aggregations of wells. So. They're binning the wells by number of fracks. And number of fracks uh, directly in the Mondi, the number of fracks corresponds to um, this, the total tonnage of fracturing fluid that they put into the reservoir. And there is a very strong correlation between the tonnage uh, injected and productivity. So they're showing you that um, wells, so 16 fracks. Basically, the bigger the tonnage, the better the productivity. So, the wells that have the most fracks, the most uh, tonnage, are significantly overperforming. One to five fracks. So, one frac is like a vertical well. If you if you drill a vertical well and frack it, and that's probably what these are actually. Uh, this is what it looks like. Sixteen fracks. These are horizontal. These are probably sixteen hundred meter long horizontals. Um, Sixteen stages. In Canada now, they're drilling uh, mostly 20, 25 stage fracks, so the curves are even bigger. This is the raw data set if you were just to look at all the wells in that data set uh, in a single township in northwest Alberta. So again, you see, you see the wide range of results, but by taking a tight curve, you're saying, okay, for the next 30 well program I drill, uh, what's my best estimate of future performance? And by having data sets this big, you can be fairly confident uh, in your average type curve. As long as there's no fundamental changes to completion techniques, um, you're not developing a different area of the reservoir. So again, when you're applying type curves, when you're applying this type curve, you have to understand the data subset that's gone into it. And that's part of what this that's part of what this plot is saying. If you just took all the wells with, with no matter what the the number of stages was, and you created a single type curve, but all of your future development wells were going to be 16 fracks, but you were including all of your wells that had one to 12 fracks in your type curve, you're going to significantly underestimate the performance of your future development. So you have to understand. Uh, whether it be vintaging, number of fracks, etc., you have to understand what's going into your data set and make sure that it's applicable to the future development or producing wells that you're trying to forecast. Uh, I'm talking, continuing to talk about building type curves. Um, generally, you take the historical production and you forecast all the producing wells. So you would add forecast on generally by decline analysis, sometimes by analogy. Uh, you're going to use your knowledge of production characteristics from low perm rocks, so you're going to know the rough shape of the curve. You're going to know what the curve should look like before you even start um, developing the type curve. You're going to compare with volumetric calculations, so again, you're going to, you're going to back check the volumetrics to make sure that your type curves and EURs are reasonable. You're going to do some statistical analysis to make sure you're looking at a solid data set. 
please. And you're going to develop a range of type curves. You're not just going to develop one type curve. You're going to develop a proved and a probable or a low best and high type curve. And you're going to have a number of different type curves for different areas of the reservoir and different completion techniques, etc. So again, this is just showing you when you're done everything in a, in a tight gas or oil reservoir, this is the shape of the curve you're going to expect to see. This is just another way to uh, display a... So all they've done here is they've reversed the axis, so your time is now on the bottom and your cumulative production is on the So the reason they're showing it this way is that it makes it... Visually, it makes it easier to bracket your results. Um, so this is showing you a 2 BCF type curve on the bottom, a 3 BCF type curve in the middle, and a 4 BCF type curve on top. And in order to, to choose which type curve you should apply to a well that has only a small amount of production, what you would do is you would plot the well's production for, so this is 0 to 12 months, so you might only have 6 months of production. And so you would plot the first six months of production, and you would determine which type curve it was closest to, which one it was most on trend with. So if your first six months uh, are up in the vicinity of this area, you would be somewhere between a three and four BCF type curve, so you would probably apply uh, a three or four BCF type curve. So that's exactly what they're doing here. They're taking the actual data from the well, which are these red dots for the first, this has got three years of data, and they're seeing how well it matches their type curve. And you can see, if they use the 3 BCF type curve, they are essentially on trend after three years. So similar to a simulation, type curves are an idealization. You're, you're really rounding out a lot of highly variable data. You have to test your model against well performance, so it has to be driven by well performance. You can, type curves uh, won't stand the test of time if they're not corroborated or supported by actual production data. So here's a gas type curve for um, a certain area. So the red line uh, is probably the type curve that was applied for the area. And you can see for most of the wells, um, it's very applicable. This type curve was probably built based on the wells that you can see out here. So because we're looking at read time, you can see the wells that have the most production performance. What this is showing you is that this type curve was built based on these four or five wells at the bottom. And why it's highlighting the upper wells, it's saying something's changed. This type curve is not applicable to whatever they've started doing. This is a newer well. It's only got half the production time of a lot of the other ones. And they have done something significantly different. So what this is highlighting is you have to make an adjustment. If this is, say they've gone from two to three fracks, to 12 fracks, um, you can't apply the same type curve that you use for the two to three fracks to a well that has a significantly different completion. And if their future development plan is this type of completion, then you have to shift your curve. All right, undeveloped locations and analogies. Um, almost virtually all the time when we're looking at undeveloped locations, we're going to be using some sort of analogy. Uh, the exception being volumetrics, uh, but we very rarely use only volumetrics. Um, so analogies must be from a known map pool. And it's just talking about some of the safeguards you need to have in place when you're using analogies. So if you're, if you're pulling production performance from a separate reservoir, you have to be comfortable that it's applicable to your reservoir. You have to choose your analogies carefully, and you have to understand uh, certain statistics like mean, median, and percentiles. Um, when you're, when you're, even after, if you, even after you've done a, um, a correct, even after you've correctly chosen an analog, even if it's an appropriate analog for your reservoir, if you don't understand the average performance of your analog, you're going to run into problems. So you have to understand the statistical distribution of your analog to make sure you're, you're choosing the appropriate measures from your analog to apply to your subject reservoir. Problems with analogies, it is a statistical method. Um, 
it's not going to be right, just like every other uh, evaluation method we've talked about in oil and gas. We're always just trying to minimize uh, our error in oil and gas evaluation. There's a temptation to use the best case as the analogy, um, but that can bias your, your data upwards you need. When we looked at that Mondi plot that had one well that was significantly outperforming all the other wells, what a lot of evaluators will do, especially internally in companies, will say that well is representative of all the future wells. Um, and if there's, you have to take into account that the reason that that well is so much better than all the other wells uh, may not be, it may just be, it may be a P10 well instead of a P50 well. And so you have to understand why uh, why you're applying the analog you're applying. Number one bias with analogies, optimism. Um, basically on the same principle, lots of poor wells and a few good ones. So this happens a lot in terms of uh, bias when, when companies and evaluators are looking at an area, they'll often throw out the worst wells. They'll say, oh, there was operational issues. Um, there was obviously significant problems with those wells. Um, so they'll throw out the low end, but they often won't throw out the high end. And in doing so, they've, they've automatically biased their distribution, and they're likely to be optimistic. Close counts, so you want to, your best bet for applying analogies is to find something very close to your reservoir. You need to compare key parameters, you need to accept the analogy only if a good match exists, and you need to review operational similarities. So it goes beyond the reservoir, and it goes beyond um, the actual deliverability of the accumulation. And when you're looking at analogies, you also have to look at the performance of the operators, the performance of the company, and you have to understand in plays like in plays like the money and the cardium in Canada, there are there is a vast difference between operators and their ability to exploit. So you have to understand you can't you can't look at the best operator in a certain play and use that analogy for a much smaller player that will not have the uh, experience or expertise. So there are a lot of factors that go, in, that go into correctly choosing analogies. So in summary for analogies, an analogy is, is just a comparison to similar wells or pools. We use it a lot. The accuracy depends on the validity of the comparison. It can be quite accurate for groups of wells or pools. Um, and we often use reserve life in indexes and type curves for our analogs.